And as you know, our Lord is giving a discourse on uh, the entrance into the eternal kingdom, which is heaven, where Sherry is now enjoying her time, along with my dad, and happy Father's Day to Dad in heaven today, too. All right, and uh, but uh, you know, the other loved ones, Danny up there and everybody else that's up there having a great time, but uh, again... Uh, uh, again, uh, we, uh, Jesus Christ was giving us uh, instruction in regard to entrance into the eternal kingdom, entrance into heaven. And uh, in this, we find him uh, bumping into a rich young ruler, as he's called, a young man who was uh, probably a, uh, a deacon in the local synagogue of the church in the town that Jesus Christ was passing through. Uh, but he asked Jesus Christ the question, how must I be saved, in essence? And Jesus Christ then goes into a little bit of a discourse regarding that, that we're noting in verses 18 through 25. This is also paralleled in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, and in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. And we're going to see a little bit of those in regard to the passage in specific uh, note this morning. But uh, going back to verse 18... It says, Then a certain uh, ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And as I've uh, taught and we've noted in this uh, passage uh, specifically, Jesus Christ uh, gives this little bit of uh, why do you call me good? Only God is good so that he could hopefully bring to the mind's eye that uh, this individual who would know God, know that God was good. And if only God is good and he's calling Jesus good, then Jesus must be God. And if Jesus is God, Jesus must be the Savior as well. So this was a little way to uh, jog his memory in regard to the Old Testament passages as to God being the Savior and only God is good, therefore as Jesus is good, uh, then he must be God. Because typically they wouldn't call a rabbi or a teacher back in the day good because only God was good. Now in uh, verse 20 it says, you know the commandment. So Jesus gives a little bit more instruction to jog the memory and also to show him what he had been doing in his mode of operation and the mentality of his soul was not one that would bring salvation to him at this time. He says, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And as we noted these on uh, Thursday of this week, they're in a little bit different order uh, than what we find uh, in the gospel, excuse me, in the uh, books of Exodus and Deuteronomy, where the Ten Commandments are given to us. But yet we have five of the Ten Commandments, and we call these the horizontal commandments that have to do with man's relationship with man. The first four is man's relationship with God and vice versa, but the last six are man's relationship with man, and these are five of the last six that are noted here. And Jesus brings these out because have you been a good person to your fellow mankind? And the man said, or the rich young ruler said and he, uh, to Jesus, all these things I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. And really that last part, the come follow me, is the important part, not the necessarily of the selling of his material goods, but we're going to get into that a little bit this morning. But come follow me because following Jesus meant that he would recognize that he would be the Savior and that he is the Messiah. Now in verse 23, but when when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And again, he couldn't just part with all the material blessings that God had given to him. And he did that to the detriment of his spiritual walk with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But today we're going to focus on verses 21 and 22. And again, going back into verse 21, he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So what we're seeing here is a little bit of the arrogance in this uh, young man's soul by saying, yeah, I do all these things. I'm a good person. I do good deeds. I've kept the Ten Commandments. I must be a good, wonderful individual. And therefore, because of my human good works, God should accept me and receive me into heaven, and I should gain my entrance into the eternal kingdom. But that's when Jesus Christ says, whoa, wait a minute, you still are lacking one thing. And so therefore it tells us just by keeping the Ten Commandments does 
does not gain salvation for anybody. Just by doing human good works, our human righteousness as we call it, doing good deeds does not save anyone. We are saved through faith alone, in Christ alone, because he did all the work, and in our non-meritorious faith we give all the credit to Jesus Christ for his work upon the cross. That's what gains entrance for anyone into the kingdom of God. But this uh, young man thought by his good deeds and his good works he should be accepted into the eternal kingdom. But Jesus says, nope, 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 that's not what uh, gets you into heaven. And then as we go and look at verse uh, uh, 22, it says, When Jesus heard this, he said, One thing you still lack. And then it goes in and sells all your possessions and distribute to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So Jesus Christ is doing uh, one th- uh, an important thing for this individual, pointing out his failure. And the one thing that he lacked was that he did not trust in God. He did not have faith in God. And as we're going to see as we get towards the end of this verse, come follow me, remember he said these exact same words to the disciples who became the apostles, and And they just left everything right where they were, and immediately they followed him because they recognized him as the Messiah and as the Savior. And as Jesus said, come follow me, they dropped all that they had, all their possessions, and then they followed along and then became part of the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This young man did not do that. He did not drop everything. He did not want to sell all his goods and give it to the poor. He wanted to hold on to these things. And there's an interesting kind of play on words that you see in the Greek, not in the Hebrew here, in regard to all of this. And I'll kind of just jump to the chase. But, well, let me uh, put it right here. Because basically... Jesus Christ is pointing out that he lacks something. And the Greek word that we have here also means left behind. And what did he leave behind in the mentality of his soul? He was leaving behind God. You see, when Jesus says you lack one thing, okay, and then he goes in and sell all your goods and come follow me, the lack that he has is what he has left behind, and he left behind God. He left behind the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And many times you and I can do that within our daily walk. When we start to think about, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this good work, and I'm going to do that good work, and I'm going to do this wonderful thing, and I'm going to do all these good deeds. But yet if we have that attitude and we're leaving God behind, Ultimately, we are missing out on the greater grace blessings that God has for us in time and then also in eternity. And for the unbeliever, if they think that they're going to just accomplish it on their own, by their own good works, by their own good deeds, that by what they do is going to gain their entrance into heaven, they, by leaving God behind, and you know where I'm going with this, are going to be left behind when the rapture of the church happens and they are going to remain on earth. Ultimately, they will not have entrance into the eternal kingdom. So one thing you lacked, one thing you left behind, and that is his faith in God, believing in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And instead, he was believing in his own human good works and how good of an individual that he was. You see, then after giving him that little uh, piece about being left behind which is going to come back when he says, sell all your possessions. Guess what? The Greek word that talks about that also in the Greek language can be mean left behind. Okay, so you left God behind. Now I want you to leave your worldly possessions behind because that's what's hindering you from going forward. So when Jesus Christ tells him and commands him to leave behind his worldly possessions, he does so so that ultimately he could then get rid of that which was holding him back. And many times, our material possessions or the things of this world, sometimes it can be relationships, sometimes it can be our job, or whatever the case may be. When we are doing those things without God in our lives, we are leaving God behind, and those things are becoming the one, number one priority within our soul. And ultimately, we're forgetting about God, and we're just going forward in our daily lives. So basically, he's telling him to has left behind God, to 
to leave behind his material possessions, his worldly goods, so that ultimately he would not leave behind the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And interesting, in uh, James chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, I'll just read this. It says, Let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, we have the same word there. What this man lacked, James is also saying you shouldn't lack anything. You should have all the things that God has designed for you in the spiritual realm. It says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, and remember, wisdom is that epinosis doctrine that is applied to life, the word of God that we apply to life. If anybody lacks that, it says, let him ask God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You see, if we're lacking in our faith towards God and what we're doing, ultimately we're thinking that there's another way of doing things. There's the world's way. There's our way. And basically we're missing out on the greater blessings that God ultimately has for us. As this young man was missing out on his entrance into the eternal kingdom with all the great blessings that Sherry and my father and Danny and all the others that are in heaven uh, today are now richly enjoying again many great blessings and the things that we have of this world are nothing compared to what God has for us in heaven and if we like to think in terms of again the uh, gold and silver and precious gems that we have on this earth and the collection of them and thinking that how much we have is a wonderful thing and how beautiful and rich we would be just think about this in the eternal kingdom there will be a new Jerusalem And guess what? Each of the doors, each of the gates, which are over 12 feet high, say they're 12 by 12, are going to be made of a pearl. Okay? How big of a pearl? Do you think we have any clams that are that big that can make that size of a pearl here on planet Earth? And we just look at one pearl, we say, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. 12 by 12 pearl is the gate. And there's going to be 12 of them. Again, how much more riches are there in the heavenly realm, even from a materialistic perspective, okay? Never mind that, but the riches that God gives us of the peace and happiness and joy that we can't even imagine today that we'll have in the eternal state as well. So, again, our Lord is basically telling him, what he tells us all to do is jettison the garbage that is within our soul that is holding us back. Again, don't let anything in this world hold you back from going forward in the plan of God. Don't let your family, don't let your friends, don't let your material possessions, don't let anything hold you back. Jettison those things from your life and then ultimately pursue God in all that you do. And now when you jettison the garbage that's in your soul, it doesn't mean you have to literally or physically get rid of those things. But you see, you can do it in the mentality of your soul, or you can do it physically if in the mentality of your soul you just can't get rid of that thing that is holding you back. And there's a whole doctrine behind that called the doctrine of separation. And sometimes we uh, are able to separate ourselves mentally. Even though we have material possessions, it doesn't mean we're overwhelmed or consumed by them, or we are uh, uh, totally obsessed and focused on those things to the detriment of our relationship with God. We We can have those things and ultimately have God as our number one priority and recognize the blessings that he's given to us. Enjoy what he wants you to enjoy, but also know that he wants you to use those things to further his will and plan in this life that you have been given. And if you can't then jettison it mentally by not having it as the number one priority in your life, then jettison it physically. You see, God was saying, or Jesus was saying to this individual, you've got to get rid of this literally, because these things are holding you back. And I know in the mentality of your soul, as long as you have these things, it's going to be calling you. Come back to me. Come back to me. I'm nice. I'm wonderful. I'm the good thing. I'm the thing that you need to have in this life. Come back to me. Okay? And it does that. And that's what your sin nature is tempting you to do each and every day. Come back to me. Come back to me. The things that will lead you away from your relationship with God. And sometimes those things are material uh, possessions or people or family or whatever the case may be that are dragging you back or holding you back. You've got to jettison them mentally. And if not mentally, get rid of them. Get them out of your life. Delete them. Whatever the case may be. And now go forward inside the plan of God. Whatever is tempting 
tempting you and whatever is leading you away from your relationship with God. Again, deal with it uh, through the separation mentally or literally slash physically. And in this case, sell all that you possess and distribute to the poor. And ultimately, uh, uh, I say ultimately a lot, I know that, but uh, everything's not ultimate, okay? But in any case, just a tick that I have. All right, but in any case, I'll try not to say it. But again, sell all that you have and distribute. But basically, we have two different Greek words, but they kind of are meaning the same thing, leaving it behind. And we also have uh, here as well, uh, come follow me. We have the words, as you translate the Greek into the English, we have two words for cling to or cleave to. You see, he was cleaving to his material possessions. He was cleaving, clinging to those things. But he is now saying, uh, Jesus Christ saying, come follow me. And instead of cleaving or clinging to your material possessions, come cleave to me, cling to me, and follow me as now we go forward in this ministry. This was the choice that this gentleman had. But as we know, he went home you know, with his head uh, down and his tail between his legs because he didn't want to give up the clinging to his material possessions. He wanted to hold on to those things and didn't want to get rid of them in order to follow the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, that's something that we all have to ask ourselves each and every day. What is holding me back from my full relationship with God, if there is anything, okay? But I'm sure there's always something. There's always these little things. And again, clean up even the little details of your life. Get that little bit of leaven out of your soul. Do a sweep and clean from time to time to even get those little things out of there so that you can have a better and greater relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if it happens to be something you absolutely have to get rid of physically, then do that so that you have a full relationship with God. Because again, think about it. You know, yes, you know, the world makes things look good. We have riches and money and gold and silver and precious gems. And it seems like that would be nice to have and hold and possess. Okay. And how much better would we be if we won the lottery? Okay. But again, if we won the lottery, we would probably be miserable, okay? We wouldn't know what to do with all that, and it would, people would bother us all the time. We wouldn't have any peace in our soul, okay? But when we get to heaven, God will put us in a place where we have capacity to enjoy all of those things. And without it being a distraction and being a total pleasure and joy and peace and contentment for all of eternity. Now, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, which is the parallel passage, it also tells us that if we get rid of these things, again, men mentally or physically, which are hindering us from our relationship with God, and in this message to the young ruler here, Jesus was saying, don't just, he didn't just say, sell all your possessions, but Matthew records, he says, if you sell them, you will what? Be complete. And the word for uh, complete, teleo, is also the word that is tetelestai, which Jesus Christ mentioned upon the cross. And he said, it is finished. When sins were paid for, the work was complete. Nothing more needed to be done. And through him and faith in him, we would have salvation. And so to this rich young man, Jesus Christ is saying the same thing. If you sell your material possessions, guess what? You will be perfect. It will be complete. And you will uh, have all that you can imagine, uh, both in time and in the eternal state. Basically, to be complete or to be perfect means that we have the divine righteousness of God inside of us. So the, all that you have and you will be complete. You'll be perfect. In other words, you will be a perfect individual. You don't have to worry about keeping the law anymore to be perfect. You won't have to worry about saying no to sin temptation in order to be perfect. You will be perfect because of the divine imputation of God's perfectness into you from the moment of your salvation. So again, an interesting uh, little phrase that Matthew puts in there that Luke and Mark uh, did not, but you will be complete. You'll be perfect, which means you'll receive the imputation of God's righteousness, and that will trump all the other humanistic works of righteousness that you're trying to accomplish in order to be saved. Instead, you'll receive the righteousness of God, and you will be given life, eternal life, entrance into the kingdom of God. And even though we may look at this as uh, Matthew and also Luke records, it may say, well, that's kind of a harsh thing. Sell all that you got? Really? Sell everything? Well, in Mark, it also says, Jesus having love for him. 
And again, this is a loving thing. And sometimes the hard knocks life is a loving thing. The hard information is a loving thing. When you tell somebody that, you know, that they're going on a wrong path and that path is going to lead to destruction, that's not a, 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 a mean thing to tell them. It's a loving thing, especially when you tell them what the road to success is, and that is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, Jesus Christ uh, it had love for this individual in the heart of his soul. The word agape is the Greek word that is used in the Gospel of Mark. And this message, though it may seem harsh in the human realm, was actually a loving message. You've got to get rid of the baggage that you've been dragging along called your mat material blessings. Jettison those things and come follow me. And Jesus Christ knew that if uh, he told him these things, there was a potential that he would get rid of those things and follow Jesus. And if he followed Jesus, what? He would have eternal life and he would have the inheritance of the kingdom of God. Greater grace blessings, both for time and eternity. But he also knew that if by telling him these things, and he did not do these things, he also knew that this young man would not gain the greater blessings that God has for him and would just live a life of worldliness. And then when the world, you know, the life in the world is over, so wouldn't the riches and blessings and everything else that he had in this life. They'd be done because... As they like to say, you can't take it with you, okay? And you can't take it certainly into the eternal lake of fire and have it with you for all of eternity. What you have is going to be left behind here on planet Earth anyway. So why not leave it behind now and then follow the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and have the greater blessings in the eternal state? So again, he was trying to give him these things because they were hindering him. They were stopping him from going forward and uh, following Jesus Christ and entering into salvation. And what we also find is that it was interesting that uh, you know this young man had such a proclivity to following the law. Oh, I've kept all the commandments. I've done them from my youth, he said, since I've been a young man or a young boy, because now he's a young man, since I've been a young boy, okay? Since my youth, he said. I've been keeping all these things. And Jesus is like, okay, well, you think you're so good at keeping all these commandments? Let me give you one more, okay? And in the Greek, again, sell all that you have is in the imperative mood, a command from Jesus. Come follow me is in the imperative mood, a command from Jesus. So this young man who loved to follow the commandments was given two more. Sell what you have and follow me. And if you're so good at keeping all the commandments, keep these two as well. And now do it. So let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> and when Jesus Christ uh, utilized that phrase, you know, sell all that you own, again, that word own mean, is echo in the Greek, and uh, that's the word that does mean cling to. You see, he was clinging to his material possessions rather than uh, following Jesus, which means he would cling to him. In 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6, to get there. But before we read in our Bibles, let me show you a few verses up on the board here. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, we have similar uh, mandates uh, throughout the Word of God. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. In other words, he sells all his goods so that ultimately he can have the kingdom of heaven, which means salvation through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He sells off all that he has so that ultimately he can follow the Lord, which this young man did not do. In Luke chapter 12, in verse 33 through 34, we've also uh, noted this. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourself money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys and then it goes on to say for where your treasure is there your heart will be also and that's the fact of reality for each and every one of us where is your treasure is your treasure in the things of this world in the people of this world in the material blessings that you have in the hobby that you might have is that where your treasure is or is your treasure jesus christ 
the Word of God, the mind of Christ, and going forward inside the plan of God. And believe you me, whatever you think of all the things of this world, Jesus Christ is a greater treasure than all of them combined. And by taking that treasure of Jesus Christ and making that yours, not only in time, but as I've explained, in the eternal state, there will be even more fantastic treasures that come as a result of that. But as long as we cling on to the earthly things, it's going to hold us back from our great relationship with the Lord and hold us back from the uh, blessings that we could have in the eternal state. In Luke chapter 12, verse 21, it says, uh, So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And remember, this was the story of the farmer who had so much and was blessed out of his mind. He teared down his bonds and built new ones so he could store even more. Jesus Christ said, you fool, you do not know that your soul is required from you tonight. Now who's going to have and enjoy all your riches? Not you, okay? Somebody else is going to come. Maybe, you know, uh, your son or your, your, your heirs or maybe the, somebody else comes along and enjoys it. But you spent all your time on these earthly riches and wealth. Now who's going to enjoy it when your life is now forfeited and you leave planet Earth? Ultimately, it's going to be someone else. And we also recognize, as uh, I like to say from time to time again, remember, it's all going to be burnt up. It's all burnt, okay? This world and all the riches and material blessings of this world is going to be burnt up one day. And it's going to be destroyed completely. And Jesus is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. So again, why are we living for the things that are ultimately going to be burnt up? when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has greater blessings and treasure for us in the heavenlies. In the book of Proverbs, we also see the wisdom in uh, uh, chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eye on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens, okay? And that's kind of another saying, you get holes in your pocket, okay? You put the money in your pocket and it just drops through the holes and it's gone. There it is. You got a bunch of holes in your pocket, okay? And so aren't uh, the, the wealth and riches of this world. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 24, it says, For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. So again, reminding us of the fleetingness and the fleeting nature of the material possessions of this world. And then we also see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And many times people think that their riches and their wealth is going to save them, especially in times of difficulty or turmoil or uh, even in health situations. But our Lord has a greater promise for us. He will never leave us. He will never desert us. He will never forsake us. He will always be there, and He will always care and provide for us as long as we're here on planet Earth. All right, so let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in verses uh, 6 through 10 specifically, it says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it either. Again, you can't take it with you. And if we, having food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who desire or want to get uh, rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. And again, it's not money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. And then uh, we'll continue on in verse 11. It says, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you have been called or were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life 
to all things, and of Christ Jesus, whom testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen and can see, or, or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Now verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world. And I'd say every member of our congregation, because you're part of the United States of America, we are all much richer than the rest of the world. So again, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is trying to instruct this rich young man that, again, these worldly possessions that you have and even your good works are not going to save you. You've got to, you know, put those things aside, either in the mentality of your soul or uh, literally so that they aren't a hindrance to you any longer. And in fact, in your notes, I, I gave you two other examples of uh, great individuals that Jesus spoke about. One was a, a, a tax collector called Zacchaeus. And remember, tax collectors were pretty wealthy. As the apostles, remember, as Jesus called them to himself, they were you know, uh, fishermen. They had industry of fishing. They had good money. Matthew, Levi, was a tax collector. Ultimately, the tax collectors were pretty well off back in the day. And so they were rich, and they dropped everything, and they followed Jesus Christ. They left behind their worldly riches to follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But then there's another individual who was another tax collector called Zacchaeus. And we're going to see him later on in the Gospel of Luke. And he came to Jesus and said, I'll, I'll give half of what I own to the poor. And if I've defrauded anybody, I'll pay them back four times. And Jesus said, you know what? Today... Faith has come to you, and you have been entered into the kingdom of God. And he was only talking about half. So the point is, you don't have to get rid of everything, okay? It's the mentality of the soul. And in fact, before this gentleman, Zacchaeus, even did that thing, Jesus said, you've been entered into the kingdom of God. He had the right mentality. Literally, he didn't have to get rid of anything. He just had to have the right mentality within his soul. And then the other uh, great example... That uses similar Greek words to what we're seeing in this passage is the uh, widow's mite. Remember the, the, the widow who put a, one penny into the offering plate. Okay, one penny. And, and it was all that she had to eat or to live on. And Jesus said she gave more than all the rest because that's all she had to give. And she gave more than all the rest. And he was amazed at that woman, and he used her as an example compared to all the other rich Pharisees who were around here that would maybe tithing their 10%. Oh, big deal. You know, I'm giving my 10%. Yeah, well, she gave it all, okay? She had the right heart, the right mentality. So, again, our Lord is uh, commanding us to, you know, make sure that we have the right mentality. In this case, distribute to the poor is what he wanted this young man to do because that also would show him a sign or, 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 or show the sign that this young man had the right heart, a right heart of charity. And remember the word charity also means the heart of love, okay? So if he was to go and distribute all that he had to the poor, again, it wasn't just get rid of it, throw it into the ocean, or go, you know, throw it in the dump heap, just get rid of it, okay? No, get rid of it by distributing it to the poor. Show your love to them in this way. And by doing that, he would have fulfilled, as I've got up on the board, the second of the greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourselves. And even though Jesus Christ went through the five horizontal commandments here that also are about loving your neighbor as you love yourself, again, if he gave all his riches to the poor and helped them out in that situation, he would have really demonstrated the love that he had within his heart. Not just the love that he had in, uh, you know, in uh, himself of, I've kept the law, I should go to heaven. No, give all the things that are closest, nearest and dearest to you to someone else. Then we'll see how your heart 
truly is. So again, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is uh, kind of testing him here a little bit in regard to his heart of love and charity and fulfilling the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But it's the heart of faith that God is looking for. That's what God is, wants. It's not, a God, it's not a heart of action and deeds, okay? Yes, we ought to do good works. Yes, we ought to do good deeds. But that's after our salvation. Prior to that, we can't do divine good works. Only after our salvation can we do uh, the fruit of the Spirit, produce the fruit of the Spirit, and produce the good works that God wants us to produce. But prior to that and after, it's all about a heart of faith. So it's a heart of faith that God is looking for. It's a heart of faith that receives the propitiation of God, that God is satisfied with the work of Jesus Christ and that being given to you as we've studied. It is the heart of faith that does not need to cling to the material possessions. And again, if you're clinging to anything in this life, again, do you truly have a heart of faith? So again, ask yourself that question. But it, if you aren't clinging, then ultimately you do have the heart of faith because you're trusting in God. And you're not trying to solve your own problems and uh, make your own way in this life. You're just opening up your arms and your hands and you're saying, I'm in your hands, Lord. It's up to you to get me through to the next day. And if that be with riches and blessings, so be it. But if it be with food and clothing and covering, and that's all I have, like uh, uh, John the Baptist and uh, camel skins and eating uh, honey, uh, locusts dipped in honey, which is actually a pretty good thing to eat, you know. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, you know, that's enough. That's enough. So again, it's the heart of faith that does not need to cling to the material possessions. It's also the heart of faith that can freely give without any strings attached. Sell all your possessions to the poor. Give it all to them. Distribute it to the poor. Okay? Sell all that you got. Give it to the poor. No strings attached. You're just giving, giving, and giving. That's the heart of faith. And then also the heart of faith is one that loves their neighbor as they love themselves. Are you more important than your neighbor, or is your neighbor more important? Are you giving a helping hand, or ultimately are you looking for the helping hand time and time again? So again, uh, by keeping the mandates that are given to us in the law, by uh, 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 doing all the other mandates that are found in the New Testament, that is all part of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. It's all also part of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's all about that heart of love that God is looking for. But again, a heart of love is one that is a heart of faith. And it's faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, faith in His Word, and faith to go forward inside His plan and not be all caught up with the things of this world or the people of this world. So what we also find here is that this command that Jesus Christ gave to him also came with a promise. It comes with a promise. And there's a great promise. Come follow me and you will have what? The eternal kingdom. You will have riches beyond. Let's go back to Luke 18. As it says in the last part of verse 22, after he says, distribute it to the poor, it says, and you shall have treasure in heaven. You shall have treasure in heaven. So there's a promise to this blessing. Just like in the Ten Commandments as we study, to honor your father and your mother, it was the only commandment that was given that has a blessing associated with it. Jesus Christ uh, gave a new commandment to this individual. Sell all that you have, distribute the, you know, the proceeds to the poor. And what you, will you get? Treasure in heaven. There was a promise that was given for that. So for us too, if we have the mental attitude of you know, a, a heart of love, loving our neighbors, we love ourselves because we have a heart of faith and we're not all caught up in the material things of this world, we too are going to have treasure in heaven as a blessing because we fulfilled the promises of God. And therefore, in uh, Matthew uh, uh, chapter 6, uh, 19 and 21, what we also uh, uh, see in regard to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and having the right mentality, uh, we see that our heart that is focused on the treasures of our Lord, then uh, we will also uh, do the final commandment that he gives, come follow me. And come follow me is what this is all about. 
As Matthew chapter 6, and I'll just read this for you quickly, in, uh, verses 19 through 21. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, again, the heart that uh, is not caught up in the things of this world but is focused on Jesus will follow Jesus. You'll follow his word. You'll follow his lead. You'll follow his command. And wherever he takes you, in whatever job, in whatever help that you're going to give to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your church, etc., etc., he will lead you. And he'll lead you in a fantastic way. And when you are led by God, then there are even greater blessings for you, both in time and then in the eternal state. And remember, as I said, all the apostles, they left everything. They responded positively to the command, come follow me. They were rich. They were wealthy. They were well off. But yet they left it all behind so they could follow the Lord Jesus Christ because they recognized him as their Savior and their Messiah, the promised one. And they, re they recognized that the entrance into the kingdom of God was through him. And so they threw off all their worldly possessions and ultimately followed him. And this same call goes to each and every one of us, as Jesus also stated in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. It says, He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow him. Doesn't mean you're going to be uh, crucified or martyred, as Jesus Christ said. But, you know, whatever the challenges, whatever the difficulties are, whatever God leads you, whatever the plan of God is for your life, Again, walk in that will and in that plan and come follow him. So as we uh, uh, close this morning, again, if we throw off those material possessions that we, again, were holding on to with our tight grips or our, so tight our knuckles were turning white, okay? Couldn't let go of these things, okay? But if we just let go of them, either mentally or physically, ultimately there will be greater riches in heaven in the eternal state when we cling to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Cling to Him in faith, trusting in Him and relying upon Him. Praying to God the Father for all your needs and all your uh, problems and all your difficulties. Trusting and relying Him uh, to provide for your every need each and every day. And allowing Him to lead you to how to apply those things in life. Whether it be on the job or at home or wherever it may be. And instead, cling to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Gain that salvation for the unbeliever. But for the believer, the greater grace blessings in both time and in the eternal state. So again, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had a great message for this rich young man, which is a great message for all of us, especially in our generation and the day and age in which we live in. Let's stop clinging to these things and instead follow Jesus Christ in our daily walk. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the great grace blessings that you have provided for us here being uh, citizens of the United States of America. And we ask that you continue to provide for our every need, Father, and, uh, but help us not to be overwhelmed or uh, focused by those things, but instead concentrate on you and the great plan that you have for our lives through your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this time. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much. Now's our time to take a, an offering so you can open up those fingers and hands and get those white knuckles to be uh, red and, uh, you know what, and... Uh, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay, let us uh, pray for our offering. Lord, we pray that you continue to bless our congregation with gracious givers and you bless all that we are able to give so that we may meet our financial obligations in your word, the truth, will continue to be taught from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.